Hello, here's uh, the great Johanna speaking. Uh, this is going to be podcast number 59. If I'm not mistaken, you'll see the right number in the title. Uh, so uh, this is my first podcast episode since I lost my TikTok accounts. TikTok decided to just wholesale ban all my accounts that I had on one phone because they gave me a device ban or a, also called a hardware ban. They basically read the device ID from your phone and then kill all the accounts associated with it. So any account I ever logged in on, on that phone was removed. It was quite a bunch of them because I had backup accounts too. I had a Dutch account, German account, English account, my backups of those accounts. And I had a playful account where I was posting memes uh, and a music account. So I lost eight accounts. So I started over, but this time I'll only have like two two accounts, maybe three, just my Dutch, English and German and no no backups and no funny stuff. Uh, I have another phone, obviously, so I can... Turns out there is a workaround. If this happens to you, you can factory reset your phone. And then your phone receives a new device idea. And then uh, TikTok would let you circumvent their previous uh, device ban because now you have a new ID and they don't know who you are anymore. Either way, it doesn't really matter that much because TikTok, on TikTok, um, even if you have like just 500 followers, some of your videos will still go viral. Meaning uh, I already I already had on day one that I started my new account. I already had a video got 14,000 views. Okay. And it's real because they also had like 200 comments on them. The comments were obviously from real people. So yeah, sure. But in this podcast episode, what I want to talk about is um, a somewhat personal topic because it relates to myself. That is... Uh, uh, on one, to put it in general terms, the importance of getting to know yourself. And more specifically, I'm going to talk about um, the combination of being very strong willed and having somewhat of a cognitive gift. So I don't mean to brag about anything. So I'll go into that as well, because it's, uh, it's perfectly acceptable that if you happen to be very smart, that you know that you are smart, right? And that you're allowed to Tell this to yourself, even if many other people around there are going to feel offended. It doesn't matter, right? You're not calling them dumb or stupid. You're just pointing something out. But I wanted to start with that first big topic of uh, the importance of getting to know yourself. I saw some someone somewhere, probably on TikTok, uh, arguing against this. They said, no, don't do that introspection. Don't go traveling for uh, several weeks or months on end like a hike around Europe or a, a travel around the world. Don't do that to go and find yourself. Don't do that to uh, get to know yourself. No, uh, leave, leave things about yourself in the unknown. Keep them in the dark. Now, I understand what they mean by that. And to some extent, I can also perhaps agree to it. You don't want to know everything about yourself. Some parts of yourself can stay a mystery. But then again, what I'm going to talk about is those very crucial aspects of yourself that if you do not become aware of them, the quality of your life will drop or, or, it, or in fact, your, your life quality will be low and stay low. By the way, I'm recording with new software now. This is called Streamlabs Desktop. I was using the TikTok Live Studio software before, but I'm not allowed to use it anymore because my accounts are banned. <laughs> And you need a thousand followers to be allowed to go live on TikTok. And you need 10,000 followers to be allowed to use uh, TikTok Live Studio, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, Streamlabs is, uh, actually works just as well. I really like this tool. This is not a commercial. I'm not getting paid. Okay. If we agree that we do want to get to know ourselves well, well enough to increase the quality of our life, well enough so as not to miss out on what life has to offer. Then, you know, I can only relate to myself at this point about what sort of things do I think were really necessary for me to get to know about myself. So let, let me put it this way. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about my personal life then. As a kid in kindergarten, at some point, either my parents or my teachers said something to each other. And as a result of that, my school, I must have been like a five year old or so, decided to put me in a special needs class. I was there for 15 minutes. And all I remember really well 
is that um, the other kids in that class, I looked at them obviously, and I could recognize something. I recognized these were the kids who were always slow to answer certain questions. If the teacher would ask you like, what is two and two? These kids would be like, uh, uh, two and uh, like the slow kids, right? Um, I recognize them as being the slow kids. That's what I, what I remember from, from this event. What I also remember is that about after 15 minutes or so, the teacher, of course, asks us questions, asked me some questions. She asked me like, you know, what's, what's five and five? So that's 10. I was very quick to answer. And then the teacher concluded, luckily, to my luck, that I did not belong in the special needs class. I didn't belong there. And so the teacher actually sent me back to the regular class. Lucky me, right? Uh, the thing is, um, I wasn't always doing well in school. It wasn't because I was stupid, but because I didn't really care so much. I wasn't really stimulated. I wasn't really interested in the work that I had to do, right? As a teenager, especially. Also because my personal character, my personality is a little bit rebellious in the sense that I often go against things that I don't believe in. I refuse to follow rules if I don't agree to the rules. If I agree to a rule, I will internalize it. That's my personality. If I don't agree with certain rules, I'm just very hard at following rules I don't agree to. And if there are too many of those rules, I prefer not to be a part of that situation at all. I don't even, I don't even want to live in a place where those rules apply too much. So you can guess that later in my life, I became this controversial political figure because I just ended up disagreeing with so many of the rules we are told to abide by, to follow. Uh, and when I was 15 years old, I was not doing well in school. I was, I had other problems as well at home, right? So I, I'm not going to talk about that right now. I had a very bad adverse childhood with loads and loads of things to talk about. I could talk 10 hours about this topic, but let's focus on one aspect of it is that, um, I, uh, uh, like I said, I was very rebellious. I lost my train of thought for a moment. So I wasn't doing very well in school. I wasn't getting good grades. So they sent me to take an IQ test. And lo and behold, whatever test it was, I don't know the name of it. They gave me this test with 100 questions and I got all of them right, except the second to last one. So question number 99, I got that wrong, but I got the last question right again. So this puts you down according to uh, whatever measure they were using, puts you in the 99th percentile something, right? meaning you are, you are very smart. You have a very high IQ. So we find out I'm actually very smart. I'm not a retard. I'm the opposite. Then why wasn't I doing well in school? Well, I couldn't care less about the schoolwork at some point. Lots of people have the same experience, right? Whether you're smart or not, you have this experience where you just don't care about the schoolwork because there are other things you would rather be doing. As a child, I was very inventive. I used to make things and create things very early on. Anything I could get my hands on. Uh, my dad had a garage with all sorts of tools and stuff and wood and iron and screws and whatnot. I always tried making stuff. Also uh, with chemistry and so on, I did experiments, right? I at some point built uh, a very primitive uh, ice rink in, my, in our backyard, very primitive. So all you could really do was slide on it, right? But it astonished uh, uh, other family members, right? Like, why do I always have this creativity to come up with these things when they could never think of these things, right? Uh, I started my own little magazine, for example, as a, t as a 10 year old, I started writing books as an early teen, uh, science fiction novels. Cause I was a fan of, uh, I, I'd been watching star Wars and, and so on and planet of the apes. And I, I felt the need to start writing my own stories. So I started writing my own stories, books in English as a 14 years old. I never published those books. They probably weren't that good. I have published books nowadays. I think I've published like 14, no, maybe 10 books or so and some translations of my own books. You can find those on Amazon, uh, like Behold the Wanderer. Uh, I really like that one. So anyway, um, this isn't about bragging, but it, this is about trying to paint a picture of, say you are this kind of gifted quote unquote or very creative child right but you have other things on your mind yet they tell you to be in school from nine to five or so or whatever it was like 8 30 to uh four or something right 8 30 4 30 
uh, they put you in the school system where they order your mind to be focused on what you are told to focus on. And that to me was absolute hell on earth. There's just no other way I can describe this. Um, I obviously didn't care about the school system, about following the rules and trying to get grades. You know what happens when kids are forced to uh, achieve high grades? A lot of people will very, a lot of students will, will very quickly figure out they only need to learn those exact few things that will be tested for uh, during their exams. And so what you get is you get a whole generation of kids or multiple generations of kids in, in Western history who have learned only exactly those things that they needed to know to get good grades and they didn't know about anything else, right? So your mind, that's the first problem with education in, in anywhere in the world, is that the minds of these children, they may have been very creative children, but creativity wasn't required. In fact, the only times that I liked doing schoolwork is when they asked me to write poems, for example or they ask me to write my own story. Finally, I get to be creative, right? But this was rare. Most of the time it is simply, you know, learning about how to do math formulas or learning about, you know, your vocabulary list for French class or something, and then just repeating that. Just, just precisely that which is needed for the test, right? Uh, the problem with this is it dumbs you down. If you are a smart person, it dumbs you down. Uh, it does not at all accelerate your personal growth and whatnot. Okay, but what I really wanted to tell you is that I, at that age, at 15 years old, I didn't know about this. I didn't know I was smart. All I did know was this. Whenever I spoke my mind to my peers, my so-called friends in school, in high school, I told them my thoughts about something and they always looked at me like, you know, that's weird. Why did you say that? You're stupid. That's stupid. You know? I always thought... As a child and a teenager, I always thought that I was stupid. I thought the reason that other people couldn't understand me is because I was dumb. And it was a, a, an incredible breakthrough for me to figure out that perhaps the opposite is true. Perhaps the reason people don't understand me is because I am the smart one and the things that I say go over their heads. Now imagine not knowing that. Imagine being very smart but not being aware of that. You will get into a lot of trouble with people. So this is exactly one of those fundaments that I was talking about earlier um, uh, about knowing yourself. There are some really important things that I think you should know about yourself so you can upgrade the quality of your life, right? So if I talk about certain things... Uh, uh, nowadays on TikTok or on a podcast, I notice that sometimes in my own thinking, I am way ahead of other people, but now I'm aware of it. Now I understand why other people can't follow me because I'm too far ahead. Even something basic, like uh, almost last year already, I started warning my fellow Dutch citizens that there may be a draft, a military draft, and they're going to recruit our young men to kill them off uh, in the war against Russia, the conflict with Russia, or the Russian war against Ukraine, whichever way you want to say it. And I already started warning our Dutch people a year ago, and everybody thought I was crazy because they didn't even know there was a war yet. They did not even know there was a war yet. So you're, you're too far ahead of people. People can't follow you. People don't understand where you are, and they think you're stupid. So it is very important to know that if you happen to be a bright person, if you have like lots of creative, imaginative thoughts, but are also able to think more about the future, you need to understand that so that you can also understand why people respond the way they do. That it's not because you are stupid, but it's because you're too far ahead of others. They can't follow you anymore. Once you become more aware of that, you can also structure your words a little bit differently to try to see how far people can follow you and then explain something more to them, right? Rather than just giving them the conclusion and they have no idea what you're doing. Well, why do you say that? What do you mean? <laughs> because people often respond with ridicule and laughter as well. Like, uh, <laughs> he thinks there's going to be a draft. For what war? And then I'm like, dude, we're at war with Russia. NATO is going to go to war with Russia. That's not true. The news didn't say so. <clears throat> yeah, the news didn't say so. Yeah. To a lot of people, something simply is not true unless they've heard it on the news. They take their concept of truth from authority, the news, politicians, and so on, or maybe their boss at work. I've noticed that a lot of normies, they take what is the truth from their boss. Yeah, my boss said so. My boss said there's not going to be a war with Russia. 
and they, they believe that. They just don't believe you because in their eyes, you do not have the same authority as the media, the government, or their boss. So that's also a little bit weird if you grow up in an authoritarian society like in the Netherlands. And by authoritarian, I mean uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the aspects of the mental life that they are dictated down from the top by government, media, and bosses. They tell people below them what to believe, and people go along with that. Largely also because... People, some people truly believe that authorities, like the government, they must know what they're doing, right? Why else did they become politicians, right? They're trained experts, and that this isn't so, they can't even fathom it that, you know, the average politician is, is, is there for a career, not for you. Not, like, politicians are trained liars. The better you can lie, the, you know, the more, success, more chances you'll get at being a, being a prime minister ever in your life. Truth tellers who are too smart, they are too far ahead of other people. They will be ridiculed, ousted, and so on. You'll be ostracized because you're ruffling too many feathers, right? You're waking too many people up and it annoys them and frustrates them. And instead of being able to do the thinking, to replicate the thinking, the thought processes that, that you did, um, they can't do it anyway. So for them, it's more like, you know, that's dumb, you're stupid, right? So I was trying to explain the importance of that. If you happen to be very bright or not so bright, it is very crucial, I think, that you become aware of something like this. Another aspect that is related to being very intelligent is, uh, and I'm not saying this to brag. Okay, okay, I'll go into this now. Why is it not bragging if you know that you're very smart because, for example, IQ tests prove it? I, later in life, I have done another IQ test. Uh, IQ test, th this was the Cattell 3B culture free test, culture fair test. Culture fair means that um, it do, your culture of background does not influence the outcome. The test is literally designed that way. So you can come from Africa or Asia or Europe and take the test and your background does not influence your outcome. It really comes down to your intelligence, right? A culture fair test, for example, shows you visual problems, but without language. Because if I would do an IQ test in Japanese, I'll score zero because I can't read Japanese, get it? So that's culture fair. Culture fairness means you're looking at visual problems, you're looking at uh, calculus and so on, right? Uh, and so uh, your background doesn't matter. So you do well on a test like that. Why is it not bragging uh, to tell this at least to yourself? Uh, if, if the IQ tests prove that you do well, and I'm, I'm talking about an, a standardized real world test, meaning you have to go to some place to take the test there. I'm not talking about the online test that you did 100 times over to, to achieve a high score. I'm talking about the one test you took at an official testing institution, right? And that score, the, the one that is a score, you'll get a certificate with a signature on it. A psychologist actually verifies that you took the test and it, it was done under the correct circumstances. That test, that test will tell you you're in the 99.7th percentile, for example, or 99.8, right, or more, right? Um, that is how you learn about yourself. Okay, you are very smart and it carries consequences. This is the reason why you have trouble socializing with other people, for example, because the majority of people aren't like that. I think at an IQ of 145, there's only going to be one in 300 people who are more intelligent than you. And at an IQ of 160, it's already one in 30,000 people who are more intelligent than you. So, so that is quite extreme very quickly. Even if you have, if you have an IQ of 145 and you're at university, you know, uh, and you're going to a, a student dorm party, even there, if there's 50 people present, even there, maybe only one of them is smarter than you. So. It is important that you at least personally make yourself aware of this. Okay, I took the official test. The test says so and so. I'm in the high range. I have a high cognitive ability. I'm smart. I'm high IQ. Why shouldn't I at least, you know, um, confirm this to myself so that I know why I have difficulty socializing with other people? And it's not because they're all stupid and it's not because I'm stupid. It's because I'm simply too far ahead of things. By the way, what is really the real difference between having a low IQ and a high IQ? Based on all my thinking about this, I would describe it somewhat as follows. Now, this is not a professional opinion. But I get the impression that low IQ people are very literalistic 
and they only observe that which is right in front of them. They don't use, for example, their memory. They don't use their knowledge of other aspects of the world. Whereas highly intelligent people, whenever they look at a problem, they're looking at all the knowledge they ever learned in their head is, is available to them. All of it is available to them. And they are able, therefore, to place the problem inside a whole set of other realities. And so they figure out you know, very, very quickly, they see, ah, this is how it is, ah, that's how it is, ah, that's how it is. Whereas the unintelligent person who has to literally look at what's in front of them has to first go through, okay, this is step one. And then they're surprised there's a step two, oh, this is step two, and there's a step two. And maybe if there's three steps, their mind already can't even process it anymore. What I'm trying to say is, in my view, unintelligent people, they don't really use their brain to solve the problem. They don't use their uh, experience or memory or uh, past solutions or other problems. Whereas a highly intelligent person looks at a problem, compares it to 20 other problems they've solved before and 50 other solutions they found for those problems, plus their memory, plus their experience, right? And then above all, their imaginative cognitive power. Imaginative powers means you're literally able to imagine things that you've never thought of before. So at least within your mind, these imaginations are entirely original because they originate from you, right? And you have never thought these things before. Maybe someone else has, but you didn't know about that. You have imagined something that you never thought of before and it came from your mind. Fill in the gaps, basically. Highly intelligent people are good at filling in the blanks and filling in the gaps, right? They get these things. They see possibilities and saying, well, this is probably the most likely or the best fit or so, right? So it's not bragging to tell yourself that you happen to be very intelligent. You need to know that. If this is so, you need to know it. Also, importantly, nowadays, uh, there's a lot of people who throw the word autism around. Uh, the problem is that in the way that highly intelligent people have difficulty socializing with less intelligent people, that resembles autistic behavior, but it isn't autism. It's just that autistic people, they have the social development problems. They are unable to socialize with others, whereas the highly intelligent person might not want to socialize with people anymore because it tires them. They find it tiresome to have to deal with these well, you know, less gifted people. See, that sounds very arrogant. And also that, I'm aware of that. Okay, it sounds, what you're saying, Johannes, that's really arrogant, yeah. It does sound that way, so you're not supposed to tell everybody, except by exception now, I talk about it in the podcast. And I'm sure lots of people will want to hear this, that there's nothing wrong with you. Highly intelligent people can become perfectly aware of other people's cognitive limitations. Whereas, you know, as they say, a stupid person cannot imagine what it's like to be smart. But smart people, if they are patient for it, if they are patient enough for it, they can kind of settle down and say, okay, okay, I kind of see now how other people's minds are a bit more limited and how I might interact with them, sorry, and how I might interact with them uh, by basically maybe simplifying my language a little bit. But the problem is if you're very intelligent, you might not want to do that. Uh, one of the problems, there's a, there's a, a woman on TikTok called uh, Coaching Gifted. Not Coach Gifted, but Coaching Gifted. She's a woman, I think she's from Denmark or something. She's very smart, obviously, and she talks a lot about these problems that highly intelligent people have. Uh, uh, one problem is that, well, if you're not aware that you're smart, you will have social problems with other people. But she also speaks about this, is that highly intelligent people will often downplay their intelligence. They will feel guilty about it even, feel bad about it. They will try to fit in so hard that they are literally diminishing their intelligence. They dumb themselves down in terms of behavior and language just to fit in when she says, well, that obviously is going to make you very depressed because she explains it this way. If you're a gifted person, meant with, with, meaning a person with highly high cognitive abilities, powers, if you're not using those powers, that's the space in which depression and anxiety arise in you. The only way to overcome that is for you to accept that, um, 
okay, I am this smart and that means I'm going to have to use my cleverness. Coaching Gifted, that, that lady from TikTok, she explains that if you're highly intelligent, you need to make sure that you set set goals that are so hard to achieve that you don't know for sure if you can achieve them anymore because that's the level of stimulation that highly intelligent people need. So you need to be a little bit of a risk taker here um, to push yourself to that limit, to push the envelope. I hope I kind of got this message across that I'm not trying to be arrogant, but there are there just happen to be people with IQs over 145 and, and, and upward, maybe 160 and up, right, <clears throat> who happen to be very intelligent and they need to be aware of that because if they're not, they can go, they can be very depressed, they can be diminishing themselves in ways that they shouldn't <clears throat> instead of looking for problems to solve difficult problems, right? <clears throat> You can create your own difficult problems. You can write a very complicated novel, for example, and then make an effort out of it to put it in the words in certain in a certain way so that average people reading it will still enjoy it. Uh, you know, some very intelligent people like Dante Alighieri, the author of La Divina Commedia, the Divine, Divine Comedy, uh, he did that. Uh, that's what the whole world, word allegory means. He wrote his book, Divine Comedy, but you can read it in two levels. One level is the, is the average person's level. And then there's the allegorical truth layered on top of that that you can't see unless you're smart enough to see it. Okay. So smart, keep that, keep in mind, smart people, they do that. Yeah. They will, they will add the, uh, the secondary allegorical layer on top of their basic writing that if you're smart enough to figure it out, you'll start seeing what they really mean. And it's very different. <laughs> um, okay, so I was talking about intelligence being one of those, you know, fundamentals that you should know about yourself in order uh, to be aware of that because it increases the quality of your life or at least prevents it from being lower than it should be. But besides being intelligent, there's something related to this. Coaching Gifted also speaks about this. Um, is that it turns out a lot of the very intelligent people also happen to be strong-willed. They were strong-willed as children. But of course, um, I spoke about this in a live show yesterday that I did on YouTube. Um, gifted people with a strong will are very likely to be punished for this as children. Because why don't you obey? Why don't you sit still? Why don't you listen to your parents or your teachers? And very quickly is because you are you are off the charts with your behavior. You're overly creative, you're inventive. Maybe you're a little eight-year-old inventor inventing things, right? Uh, in ways that your father and mother could not possibly imagine for themselves. It, you know, from their perspective, they don't have a gifted child. They have a, they have a willfully disobedient child. This child just doesn't want to listen, <clears throat> right? Teachers think like that as well. This child just doesn't want to listen. We're going to teach it how to listen. You got to sit still or else, you know, right? be quiet or else. <clears throat> Teachers do that too. Your boss may do it when, you're, when you finally land an office job somewhere. You're going to have to sit still and follow the rules. To most people, to average people, they assume that the thinking has been done by the authorities and they just have to live in that world as it is and this is how it's supposed to be and this is how it's right. It doesn't occur to them that their ruling classes are not actually smart people they themselves are pursuing personal interests. Take, for example, Hunter Biden, the son of Joe Biden. What is, he's part of the ruling class. He has a tremendous influence on his father and other people in that class. But he's a total drug addict. He's not very smart, right? This is just a bad person in it for his own sexual gratification. He couldn't care less about you or anybody. Yet those people we call the authorities. And those people get to pass laws that you have to live by. And average people, they think that that's how it's supposed to be. They think those laws are actually thought up by, by experienced, you know, qualified personnel. No, no, political laws are, are, are nonsense. They serve other interests. And yes, you have to obey to them, but they don't serve you. <clears throat> so being intelligent and being strong-willed, being strong-willed is a really big problem in a society that doesn't want you to be that way. Strong-willed children, I assume, will be mo the ones most punished for their behavior. Imagine you're actually smart and you can create things with your mind. You can create things like uh, toys or tools or in technology or books or music, right? So that's what you would like to be doing all day. But you have to go to school and follow the program where you have very little creative input. All you're supposed to do is learn this and then repeat. 
you know, input, output, input, output. It doesn't require that much creativity. Maybe at some point they'll let you write an essay or something. You can be a little bit creative there, right? But until then, uh, you know, or besides that, no, I, I did not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't describe going to school as a particularly useful uh, experience if you happen to be very creative. You know, kids can learn hands-on, but even that, we don't really do that. It's more like sitting at a desk, as I'm doing now, and then reading text, solving problems. You're an input-output module. You're not expected to think for yourself. You're just supposed to do the work, right? Uh, and so as a strong-willed person, you must have been the sort of child who couldn't sit still in school, probably. You wanted to get up and move around, right? And so they punish you for that. The whole system is designed to punish you for that because it comes down really to a sort of domestication process. Most people don't have a very strong will. And that's important to know if you're not aware of this, that most people don't have a strong will. And if you do have a strong will and combine that with, say, cognitive gifts, you're in trouble because you want to do so many things, so many creative things, right? That you, and you may be a good person about it. You want to do things that are good for other people, but the society won't let you because they're terrified that what you're doing might break society. They're terrified that what you're doing might not be what is right or that the government might not think it's right. You know, imagine, like I said, the government is not staffed with very smart people, but with people in there for their self-interest, but they've organized the society in their, in their own benefit for the upper class, right? For the, uh, I would say for the, uh, the profiting class who profit from the society. And they don't want you to upset anything that might change that relationship that they have with their people. They exploit the people and they do not want that to stop. So they may, you know, in adulthood, uh, uh, you may have trouble with the law at some point where the law will try to stop what you're doing because you're you're upsetting the system or something, right? I remember writing essays for my Dutch class as a teenager where I would always write about the system. The system is wrong because I felt, you know, I had no other words to describe it. Nowadays, I would say it's basically the government political education, you know, complex that tells you to be a certain way, believe a certain thing, and never doubt it and never question it. And mind you, most normies go along with multiculturalism for the same damn reasons. They simply are told to believe that that's the new truth and they go along with it. For a lot of people say that the LGBTQ is simply their new religion. It is their new religion to replace Christianity or to, to replace the Catholic morality. Because like I said, most people never ever stop to think about these things. They simply follow the rules. They assume that the thinking has been done for them and that's all they have to do is live it, live the rules. So intelligence, strong will, and there must be like other aspects. Uh, there are other aspects about yourself that are worth knowing about yourself. I, I think someone in ancient Greece once wrote this, like uh, uh, an unexamined life is a life not lived or something of the sort. So, you, so the examined life, what I'm doing right now, examine yourself who am I really? What do I have that sets me apart from other people? I think it's very important to understand those things. You can leave some things a mystery, I suppose. But like I said, the things that contribute to the quality of your life, I, I assume you should be aware of those things. Intelligence, being a strong-willed person, being very creative, you know, because it explains so much about you. It explains why you don't fit in with uh, normal people. It explains why... You know, if you have a very strong creative drive and you start talking to people and none of them say none of the say you go to a party and there's thousands of people, a big party, but you manage to talk to like 50 people or so and none of them have that creative drive that you have. That makes you feel very lonely, like, OK, weird, you know, this is so weird. You know, I find it interesting, like I sometimes I did that. Sometimes I went to a party or sort of maybe there were 50 people there. But then I made it my mission at some point, like at 1 a.m. OK, I'm just going to slowly go over to all the people, all of them, have a little chat with all of them. So you kind of get an assessment of the, you know, of the space. Right. Uh, and I thought it was interesting that, you know, most people are perfectly friendly and normal, but a lot of people obviously don't even want to talk to you. A lot of people say, oh, yeah, thank you very much. And bye bye. They're very, they're polite, but it's very clear that they do not want to continue a conversation with you. All right. So that's how people are, you know, and 
I think largely also because people don't really have that much to say to each other. Normal people, I think, I think don't, don't really have that much to say anyway because they don't really do much thinking. So they talk about their day, right? About what they did that day. Yeah. But they don't talk about their ideas, their beliefs, their convictions, their imaginations, their dreams and so on. That's all like more reserved because they, they may have some of that, just not a lot of that. So they don't want to give it away to, uh, to you. And of course, some people are very happy to talk to you. So uh, I always learned a lot from those kinds of events where you talk to a lot of people face to face and you very quickly find out which ones uh, you can keep talking to and which ones you can't. Anyway, yeah, becoming aware. That's the point of this podcast episode. I didn't mean to be arrogant. If you felt it was arrogant, that was not my intention. It is simply so some people have to be very intelligent. They should have the right to be aware of this. It may, even if you decide to keep that to yourself, fine, no problem, but be aware of it. If you're a very strong-willed person, you gotta be aware of that. You got like, wow, most people don't even have a strong will. Few people who do have a strong will have their will broken in childhood, break their will. There's a book called Breaking Their Will. I think that's a pretty good book. Uh, oh, my screen switched off. I don't know. Okay, so there's Breaking Their Will, right? And if you survived all that, but you maintain, you retained your strong will. Wow, you're an exception. You could be a leader, but maybe you could also just do what you really want to do rather than always be involved with other people, right? <laughs> and then there's that, you know, if you're creative or gifted in any other way, yes, you should be aware of that, you know? I'm trying to think of other aspects of life that may be important to be aware of. And I think these were quite crucial for me, at least, to figure out, okay, you happen to be very smart, and then to believe it. You know, that's a whole other step. Like I said, I used to think I was stupid because whenever I spoke my mind, people couldn't understand me. And it makes you feel very lonely because maybe I am stupid. You know, and you start to shy away, you become, oh, I keep bumping into the microphone. You, you shy away and you become a little bit depressed and so on, like, like, why should I even bother people if I'm so stupid? But then you realize it's the opposite way. I'm actually very smart. And then, you know, oh, that's why they don't get me. Yeah. I remember trying to fit in as even in my 20s, I would try to fit in by by hiding my more intelligent thoughts, and not telling people and then only talking about things I thought they could understand, you know. And my, I know I already know I already know that lots of people watching this video are going to say like, "What makes you think you're so smart? You're fucking stupid." They're actually going to comment things like that because they do that on TikTok, you know. What makes you think you're the expert on high IQ stuff? Because you're stupid, <laughs> right? No, seriously, that's how it really is. But still, it's important for you if you happen to be smart to allow yourself to be aware of it. Uh, maybe find one other person you can confide in confide in and talk to about this kind of stuff to share experience or something because a lot of people you know if you're in that one in 30,000 or so you're lonely man it's yeah you can be very lonely uh, and if you're very strong-willed on top of that you know you're going to have a trouble with this whole world you just won't like the world at all the world wasn't designed for you to become aware of this that you are not not part of the herd that's maybe the third big thing after intelligence, strong willedness and being just not being part of the herd. If you realize, OK, the way I am, the sort of person I am, it sets me apart from humanity. You have the human herd, the rule followers, the obedient people, they follow authority. Right. But not you because they don't see you as an authority, of course. So they're not going to follow you, but you are not part of the herd. Then what are you? All right. If you're not part of the herd, what are you? Well, you might be a shepherd, you know, you might be the shepherd uh, or you might go your own way and be a wolf and just uh, run away from the from the herd, you know, be a wolf and live in the forest or something. Yeah. But I think I made a good case, at least that, uh, yeah, uh, we need to become aware of who we are to a certain point. Certain aspects of you are important to know about. Uh, and uh I guess that wraps up this episode of my podcast. You know, I wonder how this one will be received. Maybe, uh, maybe people are going to uh, put me down for this one. You know, you're stupid. What makes you the expert? You know, I'm not the expert, but I'm just explaining how I think gifted people have the right to be aware of this fact that they are gifted, especially combined with a strong will. You will simply not be a part of the human herd. 
you've through through no real wrongdoing of your own not your own choice you've been set aside basically here's humanity and here's you um i don't even like that thought by the way but i think that's how it is so uh uh i'm going to keep using my creative abilities to keep speaking writing and doing whatever i want making music um yeah to, in a way i am trying to help the herd though it's not like i look down on them uh you know how do you say this best you know unintelligent people think they're smart average people kind of must know they're average right but smart people they wish they were dumb man you don't really want to be in the sort of position where uh where you can't relate to people anymore yeah you know, it's a very painful situation anyway these are just my personal thoughts you can give me uh you can attack me for it you know but i think i spoke the truth so thank you very much